Welcome to our third episode of our international showcase of a series of four focusing today on the banking industry in Luxembourg. A little bit about our fantastic speaker's background. First, we have Chris Holyfield, FinTech Development and FinTech Advisor at Luxembourg for Finance. Chris' work involves advising FinTech and financial companies looking to develop cross-border activities through Luxembourg-based platforms. He advises on the development of the finance ecosystem in Luxembourg and on the synergy creation with other key financial centers with a particular focus on China and the African markets. Jean Diderich is Vice Chairman of the Digital Banking and FinTech Innovation Cluster at ABBL. Jean Diderich has a wide experience in European institutions and a deep know-how in topics such as the creation of the digital European single market PSC2 and more. He's joined by Andre Martoboy, a FinTech advisor at the Luxembourg Bankers Association ABBL. He's in charge of the data coordination of ABBL's digital banking and FinTech innovation cluster and represents at the ABBL in the working group on blockchain and cloud at the European Banking Federation. As a third speaker and on the moderator side, we have our co-host and my colleague, Alex Panikan, head of partnerships and ecosystem development at Loft. Prior to joining Loft, Alex was a marketing and strategy teaching associate at the University of Quebec in Montreal and a serial entrepreneur uh, creating companies in the space of e-commerce and the like. At Loft, he's been traveling the world connecting fintech entrepreneurs with the, with the local ecosystem and has been a master of survival interviewing thought leaders from all walks of life. Fred Giuliani is co-director of the informatics development department at Spurkis. Fred joined the bank in 1995, where he was already in charge of the leading transformational, of leading transformational projects at the bank. Fred became deputy head of IT software development in 2002 and helped putting into place the banking software architecture that is head of IT and digitalization since 2019. Without further ado, gentlemen, Alex, the screens are yours. Thank you, Anthony. It's like assisting to the beginning of a boxing match. <laughs> a very complete <laughs> and very kind introduction. Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. It's our third, third International Showcase edition. Uh, and today we're going to focus on the Luxembourg banking industry. So we started this series of webinars uh, in partnership with Luxembourg for Finance. And it's mainly to help fintechs from all over around the world to discover the Luxembourg financial industry, but also to learn how to work with this industry. So uh, today we'll have a quick introduction of the banking industry by Chris from Luxembourg for Finance. Uh, we'll learn more about ABBL, the Luxembourg Bank Association uh, with Jean and what they do in the field of, of fintech uh, mainly. And we'll also have uh, a very interesting talk from, uh, from Sperkes, one of our main uh, banking partners and one of the largest bank in Luxembourg. How do they work with fintechs and what are the challenges uh, they face? So, and finally, we'd finish with a Q&A. Uh, so please ask your question. Please drop already your question in the chat room. Uh, we already received a few questions with Anthony in the last days regarding open banking, PSD2. So I hope we'll have the time to answer all those questions uh, before we end up in one hour. So, but before starting, let's do something more fun. Uh, it's the first time we do something that I hope it will work. So I will just launch a pool, 15 seconds, uh, just for us to discover who you are. So either you are a fintech entrepreneur, a banker, a lawyer, a consultant, or you're just curious and uh, you have a bit of time <laughs> to learn something new. So please, uh, 20 seconds to respond to the, to the pool. And then uh, I hope it will work. Uh, to see who we are talking to today. So, pa -pa -pan, 20 seconds, we end up the pool, we shared the results, and it didn't work. Nobody responded. So, thank you. We have a lot of people very passionate to participate today. So, Chris, <laughs> without further ado, please explain what's the banking industry all about in Luxembourg. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me just share my screen. So hopefully you can all see now. Um, right, and I'll get started. Okay. Uh, so yeah, as Alex said, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm just going to give you a very quick uh, run through of the banking sector here in Luxembourg, uh, just to give you some background on um, uh, what we're talking about, what, what the primary activities are here. Um, uh, but first, I think it's important also to start with a bit of context about Luxembourg, particularly for, for the banking sector. So, uh, Luxembourg, as you probably know, is a tiny country in the, in the middle of Europe. It has a population of about 600,000 people, and geographically, it's about three times the area of Hong Kong. So, it's really quite a small place, but it's not somewhere you can necessarily walk from one side to the other in a, in a couple of hours. Um, while geographically speaking, it's very small, 
Um, in terms of finance, it's a really major center. This is another way of looking at Luxembourg, and here Luxembourg is one of the biggest countries on earth. And that's because as, as an international financial center, the ac financial activities that get transferred through Luxembourg are fairly major. This is another way of looking at it. Uh, this is this is a global export of financial services, the financial service exports from Luxembourg, uh, basically equate to Luxembourg being the third largest country in the world. Um, so the big question is why is this? Um, and for me, there's, there are two real key reasons. Um, the first one is this: um, Luxembourg is founding member of the European Union, um, so the market of you know financial services in Luxembourg is not you know the the 600,000 people in Luxembourg. It's rather the you know 450 million consumers throughout the rest of the European you know the 27 27 member states of the European Union. It's the 7,000 financial institutions across the rest of the European Union, and it's the you know, 23 million SMEs, give or take, that exist throughout the rest of the European Union as well. I mean, it's also as a result of being a member of the European Union that Luxembourg can exist as a financial centre of its is. You know, Luxembourg's population. Uh, goes up by around another third every day with cross-border commuters normally uh, outside of times of uh, COVID and the, the teleworking that implies, but normally uh, goes up about, by about a third every day with cross-border workers coming to work in the financial sector in Luxembourg and then returning to the neighbouring countries of France, Belgium and Germany um, uh, in, in the evenings. Um, yeah, and then the other main reason uh, why Luxembourg exists as a financial centre is stability. Um, so Luxembourg is one of the uh, few countries left on the planet that maintains a AAA credit rating, uh, sovereign credit rating. It has, you know, up until the start of COVID, it had a, a debt to, sovereign debt to GDP ratio of around 21%. Um, and that will only climb marginally as a result of, uh, of COVID, uh, COVID measures. Um, but it's not just about financial stability, it's also about political and regulatory stability. So since the end of the Second World War, Luxembourg has had a grand total of eight finance ministers, um, which is actually a surprisingly no, low number in comparison to the rest of Europe. And it's that kind of continuity of, uh, of thought process, that continuity of politics that ties over into the regulatory atmosphere. The, the companies that are based here, that are regulated here, are very aware that the environment in which they're regulated will be subject to, you know, will be broadly similar to how it was last year, to how it was three years ago. Um, so all of these things tie into why there is such a strong banking sector in Luxembourg. So now to move into a few more specifics about the banking sector in Luxembourg. Um, here are a couple of high level figures for you. Luxembourg is home to around 126 licensed entities and employees uh, just north of 26,000 people um, with total assets of around 821 billion euros on the balance sheet and a banking income uh, of around 12 billion euros. Um, this makes it one of the main pillars banking, one of the main pillars of the Luxembourg financial uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's a very international environment. The, the, the origins of uh, the banks uh, that are present here in Luxembourg, they come from all over the world, um, not just in Europe, but also outside. You'll see a you know, sizable number of licenses awarded to Chinese institutions, also obviously a sizable, a sizable pro a proportion of Swiss banks, uh, and as well as a number of UK, uh, you know, Brazilian banks, and, and also countries from the rest of the European Union. And then just for the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, I, I'm going to talk a bit about activities. Luxembourg is primarily uh, a center for um, a variety of different banking services. The primary, one, the primary ones being uh, 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 services supporting the fund industry, so depository banking, asset servicing, custody services. Um, another major area being private banking. Um, and a third area being corporate banking. And as you can see from uh, the chart, the geographic origin of where the banks come from has a certain impact on the, uh, on, on the makeup of, uh, of, of what those banks do here in Luxembourg. So, so if we Please, look at the chart... Sorry to, sorry to cut yep. you, just for the understanding of everybody and mine. Yep. <laughs> First of all. So those are the country of origin of the banks in Luxembourg, or these, is this so, compared to other countries? No, this is the... These, so this is, if you divide the... If we use the slides here, 
um, we can divide up into various countries around the world. Okay, okay. And then if so you take, not, okay. take the activities of these banks and you assign them into you know, various groupings, uh, you will get an understanding of what those kind of clusters do. So, uh, for instance, the Swiss banks here in Luxembourg, as you can see, are primarily the, the blue section right here represents private banking. So the majority of the Swiss banks that are here in Luxembourg are highly engaged in private banking activity. Whereas if we turn over to, say, the Chinese banks that are here, uh, a main reason for them being here is corporate banking, specifically syndicated loans for their, for their, for their clients as they expand their businesses throughout Europe. Um, and then, you know, it, one, one thing that I think should also be clear across, uh, across these slides is uh, the yellow, so the, that, that's the retail banking sector, is relatively small in comparison to the rest of the banking activities. Luxembourg is primarily a, a, a B2B corporate banking centre, private banking centre, um, and it's for those reasons that they come here rather than being a kind of like a, a mass retail, retail banking activity. Obviously, Obviously, there are some supporting the local market, but in comparison to the broader membership of uh, banking uh, banks here in Luxembourg, it's, it's, it's comparatively small activity. Um, so that's kind of like a very quick overview of the banking sector. Um, I, I, I'm happy to obviously take questions or go into further detail um, if, if people have those kind of if, if people have those uh, questions uh, afterwards. But uh, uh, I'm going to hand over now to, to Alex to move on to the next uh, next presentation. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, very interesting uh, numbers. Jean, please, the Luxembourg Banking Association. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, my pleasure to present uh, the oldest uh, and the largest professional association in the financial sector in Luxembourg, exists since uh, 1939, has more than 210 uh, members. Um, we call it the voice of the Luxembourg financial sector. And um, what is also um, very innovative is that the members are not only including bankers or people from a financial institution. It's more large than that, meaning uh, I have seen that the biggest category of people listening today, 33%, are consultants. So I'm also a consultant, which means that the banking association is quite open-minded. And uh, that uh, consultants, auditors, uh, law firms, other financial um, sector professionals can become a member of the association and contribute to it. Uh, also like um, payment institutions, e-money institutions, meaning people having the status not of a credit institution, but uh, more like um, FinTech. Next, please. Voila. So what we do is we represent and we uh, develop the professional interests of our members, all categories of members. We are a hub of exchange between the different categories of people. And something very important, especially when you are a founding member of the European Union, is to have a representative office in Brussels because uh, most of our regulations and directives, they come uh, from the European Union. What is also very important for Luxembourg is, as we are a big exporter of financial services, is that through the EU mechanism, uh, you can do all over Europe a passporting on banking services and other services. So it's uh, very important for us. We provide uh, in these categories of services intelligent resources to our members. And uh, we are, of course, part of the promotion and the branding offers of the Luxembourg Financial uh, sector. So we have a management board where uh, we have a new CEO, if Matt is a former banker coming uh, from uh, Credit Suisse. Um, he has 20 technical advisors and of course can support uh, the Brussels office of the ABBL in order uh, to make the link to the European uh, Banking Federation where different um, associations of banks are representative at EU level. ABBL is much larger than um, what I represent here, as I said before. So we are the digital banking and fintech innovation cluster. It's the one you find here on this slide on the left side on the top. Um, so I'm uh, one of the vice chairman. My chairman is uh, from a bank in Luxembourg, uh, Jean Hilcher from BCEE. Uh, there is an other uh, cluster called the private banking group, the retail banking cluster. Uh, then there is uh, also another cluster where all the different law firms collaborate. 
We have our special classes between consultants and auditor firms. Um, for a long time, I'm also a member of the payment cluster uh, where a lot of, of evolution came uh, through the 2009 Payment Service Directive, later introduction of the SEPA, and recently introduction of the Payment Service Directive PSD2. We have another cluster on corporate finance, uh, one on depository banking, and of course, one uh, on market uh, infrastructure. So uh, our cluster was created in 2016. Um, it's a mix of different uh, category of firms, many law firms, many big four firms, many fintech firms, um, many digital financial services firms. So what is uh, very important is that our cluster intends uh, to exchange knowledge of what is going on in the digitalization of financial services and especially two aspects, meaning on one side, you have the evolution of the financial services and its digitalization. On the other side, you have the disruption or the revolution coming on. And so we are, we are covering both aspects. On one side, uh, we want to, to give all necessary information to the traditional banking members. And on the other side, we want to connect with all different fintechs in uh, Luxembourg in order um, to make uh, financial institu institutions here in Luxembourg more uh, customer-centric, that uh, we have a more focus on the, really the technology and the digitalization of banking services, um, everything around uh, data-driven, and uh, of course, staying very competitive in uh, that uh, area. Um, so as I said before, my chairman is from the BCEE, he's a banker, um, I'm from a consulting firm, Waystone, and my, uh, the second uh, vice chairman is Raoul Mölheim. He's um, co-founder of Phenology, which is um, Luxembourg uh, FinTech. And we are representative at the ABBL board by Philip Seal, who is the co-CEO of uh, Clearstream and who is mainly in charge of infrastructure uh, in, uh, um, in Luxembourg, Europe, and uh, worldwide. So what is important to understand and why you could join us or you should even join us is all actions and activities uh, we do. So we have all in all three goals. The first is to share knowledge. So we are making and organizing matchmaking events. Uh, we, we drive uh, fintech uh, grids, meaning speed dating events uh, for banks and fintechs where they can exchange information and get to know each other much better. Uh, we may organize workshops on fintech and innovative topics. Um, there is traditional meetings on ABBL meet members on specific um, financial digital topics. Then uh, also what is important is that we support financial institutions, traditional ones, to set up their own innovation facilities in Luxembourg, and we have several ones. Um, and we have also run in the last year's uh, open banking uh, seminars on uh, payment service directive, the APIs, and with uh, APSI and the LOST. We, we run uh, on goal two to cooperate with stakeholders. It's very important in order to do so. There are different work groups, one on cloud computing, one on DLC blockchain, one on the stable uh, Libra, on big data and analytics. What is important for us is to contribute on different topics to the Luxembourg High uh, Committee uh, of the Financial Center. And we have many bilateral exchanges with other associations from the fund industry, insurance, digital, um, data protection, uh, regulator, um, and so on. Uh, and we are linked, as I said already before, to the European Banking uh, F Federation. Uh, where uh, we support the digital strategic uh, group as well. So uh, the contribution to the fintech uh, ecosystem, uh, different studies have been organized, one now on COVID-19, uh, jointly with KPMG, another one uh, between the cooperation of banks and fintech with r and business advisory, one on the cloud adoption with KPMG, uh, another one on the DLT adoption with uh, Wavestone, and then also uh, some research projects. One is the application of uh, DLT, the, uh, meaning the blockchain to KYC processes, 
uh, and this is funded through the ABBL uh, Foundation. Um, so there's also another research project on uh, fraudful artificial intelligence on uh, instant AML, meaning anti-money laundering, uh, because as you know, if you do instant payments, you, de you need also to have an intelligent anti-money laundering uh, process, which is also uh, instant. So um, you can find a map uh, that we maintain at fintechmap.lu. Uh, so it's all fintechs that are members uh, or who are connected, all members of ABBL, you can find um, on this website. So uh, there's an, uh, a fintech service pack for fintech firms uh, where you could uh, subscribe and uh, you can be part of the list of the ABBL. So all the community is aware of what you do in Luxembourg and this will help you also to connect to the financial uh, center. Perhaps the last one, yes. So um, if you want to contact us, uh, you have the email of uh, Andre Matovoy. He's our advisor and coordinated. So he's also part here uh, in, the, in the webinar. So if you have any questions, feel free um, to ask them. And we will try to give you the best possible response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Very kind of you. And thank you, Andre, to be with us. I can say that you are the banker in this webinar, Andre, because you're the only one wearing a tie. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to, for being with us. And uh, anyway, we'll share all the slides uh, with uh, the participants and we'll add your contact details at the end, uh, if you don't mind. And uh, we'll come back to you uh, during the Q&A because we have many questions. So right now, I'm gonna be very brief. I'm gonna ju just share with you uh, my presentation. Uh, pa -pa -pa, share screen, let's see. I just have, need somebody to tell me if you see my screen or not. Yes, perfect, thank you, Chris. So I'm uh, just gonna do that. Um, so about the loft, uh, again, I'm gonna be brief because the goal is to have a interesting Q&A. So we are mainly uh, a foundation, uh, not profit, not-for-profit uh, foundation, and it's a public-private partnership between the Ministry uh, of Finance, Ministry of Economy, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Luxembourg of Finance, uh, huge supporter, and 20-plus uh, private partners. And those partners, as you can see, uh, some of them are bankers, and uh, the idea of the loft is to foster innovation in the financial industry by connecting the fintechs uh, and the innovators from all over the world with the local, uh, local industry. Uh, we do in have incubation. Uh, we host today, I think, around 74 firms. It's changing every week, uh, so I keep, uh, I'm trying to keep count. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, co-working space, uh, open desk, closed offices. Uh, we work closely with the regulator to make sure that on the security side, uh, everything is okay. Uh, and it's a fun space. Um, we also have a fintech map. <laughs> so coming back to what uh, Jean was saying, so with uh, ABBL, but also with the ALFI, the Fund, uh, Fund Industry uh, Association, and ACA, the Insurance uh, Industry Association, we have a lot of uh, association in Luxembourg, as you can see. So we put together this map. Um, as you can see, we have a huge portion of fintechs who are on the payment side. But for the last three years, since uh, we created the loft, uh, we have a lot of companies in the fun tech, in the reg tech, blockchain, and lending. Uh, we also moved the uh, um, headquarters for Europe in Luxembourg. So as you can see, it's an ecosystem that's quite growing and could be quite interesting for you. So why those people are coming to Luxembourg? Uh, Chris already explained, we are huge financial centers. Uh, most of the banks are here. Um, but something that's maybe worth mentioning, um, language. So um, my English is not perf perfect, but uh, most people in Luxembourg speak on average are 3.6 uh, languages. Uh, everything can be done in English. Uh, regulation is done in English. Uh, you can also do it in French and, and German. Um, so it's quite convenient if you are looking for a place that's an alternative to other places that are uh, are not in Europe anymore uh, due to Brexit. I will not name them. Finally, I will finish with the ecosystem. Uh, so that's the very interesting part of Luxembourg. So we have a full value chain uh, that's here for the fintech industry. So we have support from public initiatives as the loft, but also from private initiatives, uh, be it incubators and be it clusters, as we mentioned, ABBL, Alfie, 
of Digital Luxembourg. On the financing side, we do have a few VCs, uh, but we also have special schemes from the Ministry of Economy that can be helpful. And finally, we have the European Investment Fund as based in Luxembourg, and they have a special scheme called the Luxembourg Future Fund, and that's also uh, quite interesting on the funding part if you're looking for funding. And finally, uh, it's worth mentioning, we have a great university, uh, the SNT, who is the technological department of the University of Luxembourg. They are working a lot on, with fintechs. By the way, I think they will also work with their BBL on uh, some QIC projects. So they understand fintech, they understand payment, they understand AI, and they understand uh, blockchain. So that's very interesting if you're looking to do a research and development project with uh, academia. Luxembourg, uh, Chris mentioned it, it's very international. So I think uh, just here at the loft, we have 20 plus private um, hubs partner all over the world. But we are part of what we call the talent route in Europe. So we work with 15 uh, fintech hubs based in Europe. So if you're coming to Luxembourg, uh, you're going to serve the local market, but we're going to help you connect with other regions from Europe. Be it Spain, Italy, Denmark, uh, Eastern Europe now. So we are a gate uh, for fintechs uh, to Europe. And that's it. So the loft is mainly, as I said, a community uh, where fintechs, uh, research uh, centers, uh, banks, funds, they are all coming together, trying to work and uh, define what the financial industry will look like uh, tomorrow. So that's it for me. I will share some information details at the end. Hello? Okay. Can you see? Good. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, good, perfect. So now I'm gonna move to the interesting part. Fred, are you with us? I've lost you. Yes, hello. Um, I'm hello, Fred. You. I'm just <laughs> Thank uh, you. trying to share my screen. One moment, please. Perfect. So Fred is from uh, Schwerkes, BCE. Uh, Fred, you are one of the largest bank in Luxembourg, right? Yes, we are. We are mainly a retail bank. Um, but um, also very interested by the digitalization part. Exactly. And, uh, Hello all. Thank you to be with us. Please, Fred, the mic is yours. Thank you. Hello all. Thank you for joining this presentation. During the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, we are going to speak about the collaboration between fintechs and banks and why some problems arise and how we go around them. Let me first make a, a disclaimer. Some statements I will make are uh, a little um, exaggerated or overstated. Um, this is done on purpose. I will draw um, a black and white painting and we all know that reality is not black and white, but it's a lot of gray sh shades of gray in between. Two years ago, I, um, I uh, joined an European FinTech exposition in, in Vienna. And after the exposition, I was attending um, a privately organized panel between fintech owners and banks. And um, we spoke about the problems that came um, around collaboration between those two units. Um, the fintechs reported several problems, but one problem that always came up was the question, why does it take so long to have a partnership with a bank and to go to production? And this is all about the sales cycle and how much money a fintech has to put into it before uh, the, co the collaboration works. One of the participants um, made the summary like this. First of all, it's very difficult to find the right person in the bank to talk to. When you find the right uh, person in the bank and he likes your idea, then it takes time because he has to go to his boss and to present the idea. The boss, if he likes the idea, he will come back to you and it's the second meeting with all the same content you already had in the first meeting. If after that meeting, the boss is still interested in, in working with you, he says, hey guys, now you have to go to see IT. Then you go to the IT department and um, there are not one person, but there are three persons with different interests. One in security, the other in operations and one in application development. And then for the third time, you have to do all your presentations, all saying the same things again, answering the questions, and it takes time. When all these people then are, are still convinced that it's a good way to go, they do a business case and they go up to the bank's board. The bank's board will then say, 
hey, risk management, have a look at it and tell me if this is okay with the bank's regulation. And the risk management will call you again and you will have to see all the guys from risk management. They are asking the same questions and you have to go all over it again. Suppose now that um, they are still uh, very in favor of your, your project, your, your solution, then they hand it over to legal. And legal, of course, they will all have to say about the contract that will be done between you and, and the bank, and it takes again some time. Suppose that all the, that you avoid all the pitfalls, then you, you get a, a, a signage on the contract and say, yes, I did it. But again, you go back to IT and they tell you that they have release cycles and that for the next release cycle, it's not okay to have it, that it will take three additional months to this. And then when you go live, it's about uh, 12 to 18 min uh, months where you as the FinTech probably thought it would take three months. And that's one of the, the big problems that I call highly agile versus highly regulated. In fact, you as a FinTech, you are agile and you want to move fast and that's great. Banks on the other side, they are regulated entities. They, they um, people put the money in that bank and so they are highly regulated in order not to lose that money. Um, they are submitted to supervisor authority. They have three lines of defense being the operational, the risk management, the audit, etc. And banks are, um, how shall I say, they are used to not take unconsiderated risks. They take risks, but they are very cautious. So they have put into place checks and balances, and there are a lot of control points to go through. So on the collaboration side, you as a FinTech, you have to convince, of course, the business side, the risk management, the IT, and the legal. And one advice I can give you, after the first meeting, ask the business side to bring along all these persons because only when you have them all in the meeting and they are all participated and convinced um, about your project, then it will go further very quickly. So um, I have to say that in the last two years, a lot of banks have made a lot of progress in this uh, area and they have taken appropriate measures. They have normally now a special team in place that will act as your single point of contact and uh, things will probably get uh, much faster. But not all banks have done this. The second point is that when they look at your FinTech, they see, of course, a great company and maybe a great product, a great service, but they also see the FinTech as an operational risk for the bank. Um, let's begin with the, the business side. Of course, they have some interests. Their interest is to use your product, to increase customer satisfaction, to drive up profitability, to, um, to make more revenue. And they are probably your biggest sponsor in the bank. But even these persons, they have some fears. And one of their fear is, what if the new product or service I'm offering from the FinTech to my customers is not successful? Will the blame fall back on them? Are they made responsible for the failure? And suppose that if it is no question of blame, then even if the product is not successful, then there's the question, we have sold now so many units to customers, how are we going to stop it? How can we tell the customer, okay, this was something um, that went wrong, how can we go back from it? And then there's of course also um, a personal question in it. If the FinTech has a great product, maybe, it makes the bank or, or the advisors um, uh, much less needed. And uh, they, there's also, of course, the fear to get this intermediate in the, whole, in the whole process. So in order to get the business on your side, one thing which is good is provide a market analyst for your product or service. Nobody knows the product better than you because you have been building it, you have been putting research in it, and you probably know better than the bank how to market it to their customers. Help them, advise them on how to do, and build a value proposition for the bank that they can defend before their board, so that they can, can convince the board about it. The next part is risk management. What keeps those guys busy at night? Well, um, they are there to keep the risk for the bank as low as possible, or at least at the manageable level. 
So what are their fears? Well, they fear that maybe your company will not be there in two, three, four, five years. They will fear that maybe you sell your company to somebody that will not continue the partnership. They fear that if your company goes out of business, that they have an operational problem that they can't continue the service provided to the customer because they rely on, on you. They will always look for an exit strategy, a path. So if you should go out of business or if you should stop simply the product, how can, can the bank uh, have an exit from it? And of course, they are also afraid maybe that you are doing mistakes that will harm the bank's customer. So it's also a question of liability. So what can you do to, to persuade these guys that you are the good partner? First of all, provide a business plan. And if this business plan looks sound to them, then they know that you will, are going to survive and that your product will be a success. Offer a plan B if for one reason you should go out of market. This is often say, hey, should we ever go out of the market? You can use our technological solution, etc. from 12 additional months if you pay for it and you host it at some some host or, or something. So give them some options if you should go out so that they have a period to, to recover from it. And explain them how you will mitigate the risk your fintech is facing. These are people of numbers. These are very rational and logic people. You can really discuss well with them. The third part is IT, and IT is probably more than one. I will begin with IT security. So their interest is to maintain secure and trusted systems. So if you, if you speak about collaboration with them and interfacing your systems to them, they are thinking about all the security. Is there a risk of getting hacked through it? Is there the data leakage problem? Is the service GDPR compliant, et cetera? So they are all, speak, they are all uh, taking into consideration the overall security architectures. And if you want to help those guys, provide them with your security architecture documentation, documentation of the system. Explain them in detail how you handle different security scenarios. If you have them, and that would be great, show external security audits and pen tests so that they are reassured that you are knowing your job and that you are going, doing a, a good job. If you have any ISO um, or any security certifications or are supervised by banking authority, that's of course the golden standard. Then oh, IT so operations. To cut, you, so to cut you, Fred, when you say the, the um, being uh, supervised by the authority, are you meaning, mentioning the PSF license? That's what you have in mind? Exactly. For, for example, if it's a PSF license or even if you are speaking about um, uh, open banking and you are a TPP, so it, it gives already some more credit to be registered. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. you have to. Um, IT operations. Well, these are the guys who keep the systems up and running for 24 hours, 24 hours, seven days a week and 365 days a year. These guys are concerned with Will the fintech system impact the banking system? What if the fintech is offline? Will the banking system going offline too? How can we um, close the gap between the, the, the reliability between the two systems? They will be in interested about disaster recovery and continued and um, business continuity. Um, and they are of course very interested to have um, skilled technicians on your side that they can uh, help or th that they can address their questions to and they get help from. So basically, what can you do for them? Provide them an SLA with your product or service. Provide the disaster recovery plans and tell and show them also that you have already tested them. Describe your suppliers, your cloud partners, etc., so that they know that you're working on a reliable system. And offer a helpline for their technicians so that the technicians don't feel to be alone so that they always know, hey, I have a phone number, I can call somebody from the FinTech if there's a problem. And then you get IT applications. And these guys are probably also some of your supporters because they can integrate new cool features into their banking software. But of course, um, they also have some fears. How do they integrate the FinTech technology? They come more from a legacy background, so they will know 
Java, .NET, COBOL, more legacy programming languages, and they know uh, much less about JavaScript and other new uh, development languages. They will also ask if the FinTech has skilled technicians that may help them with the interfacing. And of course, what is the, how often does the, um, the system of the FinTech change? Are there modifications that are to be done on the banking system? So these are all the questions that will bother to these uh, guys. What we'll always have is if you provide adequate documentation and code snippets in .NET and Java. So that they, this will really help the guys to, to, to get operational very quickly. Fix an upgrade policy and, and underline that you will be backwards compatible with your product or service for at least six months, 12 months. So give them some guarantees. Propose to have common workshops so that they learn how your technology works and how they can integrate it best. And then have some common playground environment where they can test everything, where they can play around with it and uh, make their code work. And then we have last but not least, the legal. What is their interest? Their interest is to have a sound relationship covered by legal agreement between the parties. And um, what, um, what do they look at the contracts? They want to be to make sure that all important items are covered in your common agreement. This comes from SLA to liabilities to intellectual property to termination, etc. And they want it to be, um, how shall I say, an, an understandable and uh, fair agreement. But they want also to make sure if they put some clauses into it that you understand the agreement that they are still convinced that it's a good agreement. And then, of course, if something should go wrong, it's also about is the agreement enforceable? Can I, can I really use it if I need to? So basically, what will always help in, in such a situation is to provide already a fair agreement model for discussion. You know your, 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 your product and service better than anybody else. So you can really work on that agreement and it will help you with every bank. Explain also what elements are important for you to be in the agreement so that they can really be in the agreement. Explain also what elements you have explicitly taken care of so that they understand why they are in the agreement and why this is important to you. Um, and then they are more like um, law lawyers uh, parts. It's, it's of course about the laws. If you have an agreement with Luxembourgish bank, the lawyers of the bank will feel much more comfortable with Luxembourgish law than with US law. Um, so basically, if you have to put it up, put national laws. If you don't want to make that, put EU laws and then only go to non-EU uh, laws because that will be probably some point of discussion with the lawyers of the bank. And then this is the jurisdiction that means some just if you go to court, where are the courts that uh, will take in the case? So basically, these are the, the main points which, which will really help you to speed up the, 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 the sales process, the, the go to production uh, process um, if, if, you, if you follow it. Then the third question is about open banking because it was um, explicitly asked that I also speak about open banking and we have already collaborated with some um, fintechs in, in that uh, domain. And um, there are some lessons to be learned. First of all, there are banks who are quite familiar with APIs. If you go to BBVA, if you go to Deutsche Bank, they are all um, how shall I say, the golden standard in APIs, they have teams that do nothing else but uh, sell and market their APIs. They will help you to use them. They will help you to put everything into place. But most banks are not that advanced. Even if they are, and, and if they are smaller banks, they probably don't have all um, that into place. So um, first of all, most banks will be happy to work with you. They have put into place their PSD2 APIs and um, they have a positive attitude to these APIs insofar that they want their APIs being used. They want to stay relevant in, 
in the banking context. And that is to be offering the APIs and your software using those APIs. Um, basically, not all banks have API managers. So the API may be published somewhere, the specifications are there, um, but it's difficult to join somebody in the bank. Have a look at the, um, at the API, have a look at their website, have a look at the developer portal, and you will see on, on, on what level the, the bank is really is. If you want to use the APIs, follow some rules, and they are very simple and they are just um, uh, common sense. First of all, inform the bank that you want to use their APIs. They will probably be happy to help you in the setup. Announce periods of extensive testing. If you want to test it, tell them before so that they can have people dedicated to the test that will help you um, with the test and that will assist you should something go wrong. If you need a specific non-existing API, feel free to ask the bank if they are willing to provide it. Maybe they just didn't think of it and they find it a good idea to provide such an API. And I'm sure that they will have a look at it and uh, come up with an answer. Then there's always the, the, the problem with the APIs. Yeah, um, an API, it's, it depends on the standard you use and how it is called. Maybe it does not work 100% like it's specified. So if it does not work 100% like specified, contact the bank and tell them that there's a problem. But be very strict on it. Tell them that you are working on it and that you need that fix. So fix also deadlines for the fix that they know, okay, this is an important matter. Somebody is using it. He can't use it like it should. The API is not working like it should work. So we have to fix it. And you can also propose to help to test the fixes because they will... They can, they can do the fixes, but it always helps if somebody else helps them with the test and says, no, it's okay. Fred, we I are think, running, um, run, running out of time, so I don't know if it's... I if just have one more, okay, go ahead, please. one more sentence. The only thing you shouldn't, should not do is play unfair. If the bank's API is not working, don't go directly for the regulator. Inform the bank that there's a problem. Inform them that you will need it. Inform them that uh, they have one week or two days or three days to fix it, and that afterwards you can go to the regulator, but just don't play it unfair. And I think most banks will then be more than happy to collaborate with you. And that was already everything from my side. Thank you. Fred was fascinating, very, very interesting stuff. Thank you so much. I think we should have one dedicated webinar just for you for some of our fintechs. <laughs> they will learn Thank a lot. You. Thank you, thank you so much. So Fred, first question, I'm gonna start with you and then I'm gonna give the mic to, um, to Andre and, and Jean. It's a question we have from uh, one of our fintechs, in fact, uh, from uh, Mauro. Uh, it's, so it's a fintech based in UK and Italy. They are a member of the loft. But the question is, uh, first of all, if they can join the BBL committee, so we'd be happy to put Andre's email. Uh, you can ask him the question directly. But what's your suggestion for a fintech that's not based in Luxembourg to work with a bank like yours, Fred? Uh, what's your intake? Yeah, um, basically, if they want to, to work it with us, I mean, we all speak about the re European market. So Europe is um, now clearly one of the, of, the, um, of the main market. The question is always about what does the product or service does the fintech offer? We, as a Luxembourgish bank, we are, looking at the, we are looking at the Luxembourgish retail customer. So basically, the question is always, can, is it something that is interesting for our customers? And if it is, um, I think that uh, the country does not uh, play uh, a major role. It's more the fit of the product, of the solution, and how you can use it in your banking context. For, that's the, the main part of it. The country doesn't play a role as long as it's uh, somewhere uh, you supervised uh, and, and, and stand in with the standards of Europe. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean, Andre, maybe you want to, to say something? Andre? Jean? Yep. Yes. Okay. So um, what we can say is meeting um, the, the purpose of TSD2 and the open banking is that is uh, European wide, meaning all EU countries and the extended zone of uh, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein. 
So, uh, of course, you can passport, and it's very important that every bank in Luxembourg can work together with every fintech and uh, vice versa. Um, of course, as uh, Fred Julian was saying, uh, some, some functionalities are very specific. Like, for example, if tomorrow you won't have a fintech in uh, mortgages, the Luxembourg ecosystem is very different from other ecosystems, so it will be very difficult. But if you have uh, small uh, credits or other things, um, a global approach can be uh, of, uh, of, of importance to it. So I think it depends on the functionality you want to propose as a fintech. Perfect. Andre, you want to add something? Oh, just maybe a small point that, of course, when uh, the question is about yeah, to what extent EBBL is open to the cooperation with the fintech firms, which are not yet, uh, let's say, um, installed in Luxembourg, of course, I would like to say that yeah, we are open to any kind of interactions. Just feel free to drop me a line yeah, by email, and then, then, of course, we can understand uh, yeah, how we could be of uh, help to, the, to those fintechs, either to get in touch with the banks or to be kind of a yeah, hub of getting connected with other stakeholders. Thank you so much. Before giving the mic to Piotr, because he has a question that I don't understand, so I will ask him to ask him the, his own creation. Uh, question from Najia. So to Fred, uh, how can a fintech secure the first sponsor or ambassador with your bank, Fred? Uh, and how to make sure that the POC and the deployment is well perceived by the employees? Okay. We have um, a new department which is called Business Innovation Office. And they are the single point of contact for fintechs. The guys uh, who are in charge are Roger Kramer and uh, Alain Scholtes. And um, they, will, they will look at it and they will make sure that everybody in the bank who is related to it will get informed, um, will have the, the necessary information and uh, can then express his interest in it and uh, make the first uh, tour of discussion. And they are great guys, I have to add. <laughs> yes. Very, very collaborative, very open to work with fintechs. Um, uh, so, Anthony, can you give the mic to Piotr, please? He has a question I, regarding QIC, I don't understand. Please. Piotr, are you with us? Hello, yes. Yes, yes I, please, go ahead. Uh, yes, the, the, uh, I had an experience with, with, with Spurgess, uh, and uh, uh, they claimed once that, uh, you know, they accept only they own uh, bank KYC processes. They don't accept, they don't rely on, uh, on the KYC processes by the firms that are coming for them. And, uh, uh, and they don't, they not, and Spurk has told us that uh, uh, they don't have enough uh, people, they don't have enough resources now, you know, to, to, uh, to extend uh, the business beyond their own uh, procedures that they have at the moment. Just to make sure that you understand, Peter, you you are speaking about what opening a bank account, or it's working with which purpose? No, no, it's it's when when you are coming to a bank with 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 idea, you know, for 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 a business, for for a project, you know, uh, they they of course, like Fred said, they are requesting a business a business plan. They are requesting all those things that that was that were mentioned. So I will not be repeating that. But you know, and at certain moment, they are coming to the conclusion that there is a kind of showstopper, and in this case, it was. KYC check, you know, if you are bringing, let's say, 10 or 20 additional clients, you know, the bank could have limited resources to, to accept this uh, into their own banking process. Uh, I'm not sure I understand, maybe Fred understood the question. Um, I'm not sure, but I will try to answer it um, like I understood it. So um, basically, what I understand is that your, your value proposition is also bringing customers that will also be than Spurkis customers. And as such, they will, of course, have to go uh, through the due diligence custom approval process. And of course, that's something that takes a lot of time and um, that has to be done thoroughly. I do not know exactly all the procedures these guys do, but um, the compliance officer, they have um, a whole desk where every customer that comes has to be approved. Um, there has to be a risk matrix to be made etc etc and what i understand is that the customers your fintech has or they would also have become spurkis customers and then spurkis would also be liable for these customers is that correct i guess so <laughs> thank you so much yeah. <laughs> thank and you then that. of course it is if somebody brings customers and the bank will be liable for it then they want to have their say in accepting these customers 
which which makes sense. Thank you so much, Fred. A question from Sergey. So he's asking, how do they uh, can get a license from the CSSF and on the, which regulation fintech can be to work with the financial industry, and especially banks? So it's coming back to your point, Fred, regarding uh, the PSF license. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can explain what the PSF license and then give, giving the mic to, to, to Andre or even maybe Chris, if you answer. Go ahead, please. Um, so basically, you have to say that there are a, a several licenses that make that you will be supervised by the CSSF. But um, there are also other supervisory authorities for, for other companies. But if we stick to the financial sector, there, there is a whole legislation on it for credit institutions that have a special uh, a special status and there is something of uh, it's called particular the sector of financier the, the PSF and it means that you are doing some activity which is related to tech and to finance and then in order to have the status you are also supervised by the regulatory authority and if you do that a lot of the checks that the bank has to do with you as a company they are already done because you have that license and everybody knows that you are conforming to those standards and of course, that takes a lot of burden out of the bank because the due diligence is much easier. But let's make it clear, this license is not mandatory to work with the financial license. It's not mandatory. I just say, if you have it, then a lot of questions, you don't even have to provide the documents because they are self-answered. But of course, it is not mandatory. It, it's not even something that, that, that is really recommended. But if you have it, it's, then it it's opens a lot of doors. You want to add something? Perhaps, perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps I can say something. Yeah. Um, so what we can say is there are two categories uh, of um, regulation. One is the national uh, regulation, like Fred was explaining, about the professional of the financial sector. This is only valid in Luxembourg and is not exported, or meaning other countries have some have different um, different schemes. But let's say it's a little bit special to Luxembourg. And uh, the historic is uh, coming from the times where uh, we had uh, uh, banking secrecy. And in order to have non banks uh, being able working on technology uh, around the banking secrecy. And then we have all EU regulation. Of course, the bank is a credit institution regulated by the central bank and uh, by the CSSF. And then you have uh, something called an e-money institution, which is coming from the e-money directive, and which has limited capacity of safeguarding money on an e-money account, around 2,400 euros um, a year. And then you have something called a payment institution, which was introduced by the, uh, by the PSD in 2009, and that is also where the Luxembourg fintech started really because most of the fintechs got then in luxembourg a payment institution license because you can passport all over europe meaning you get a luxembourg license and you can make business uh, in the eu with 550 million uh, consumers uh, which makes then luxembourg also a big market having a license on the pi now with psd2 there have been two more status added one is an account information service provider, which goes to the APIs, as Fred was explaining, to access current accounts and get the information out of it in order to make a consolidation of information of different accounts you can have with different uh, banks. And um, the other one is a payment initiation service provider. This is someone who is initiating um, directly um, a credit transfer and a SIPA credit transfer over your current account to make a payment and get the confirmation directly. So this is as a bank uh, payment, replacing card payment, meaning a card, you give a card payment in Amazon PayPal, you get immediately the confirmation that the card payment was accepted. It's the same, but the payment is coming from a current account. And that's the status of the payment initiation service provider. Thank you, thank you, Jean. That was very explicit and very clear. Uh, I guess I don't have anything. Andre, do you want to add something? 
uh, maybe just kind of small that I did indeed actually yeah, in addition to the older types of the different licenses which we have on maximum of course I, I would like also to reiterate uh, the fact that of course in case if if those kind of fintech firms are already licensed in their home countries of course the banks here yeah, should be informed about those licenses and even in the case uh, that uh, let's say you are not entitled to any kind of yeah, supervision either in your home country or in Luxembourg, of course, such a kind of communication would also be of importance for the banks to understand that actually you are legally okay, of course, to deal with the banks, uh, taking into account the, all the measures, measures which are being explained. So I would say that technically speaking, it, it, is, it is not compulsory, but nevertheless, of course, it gives some kind of yeah, a portion of trust yeah, to the fintech firms which are interested to get in touch with, uh, with the banks located in Luxembourg. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andre. One last question. We are running out of time, uh, but this one is quite dear to, to me uh, and to the loft. It's about talent. Uh, because, you know, uh, maybe 20 years ago, when you are a young graduate, you want to work for, for a bank. Now you want to work for a startup. So can we give the mic to Baptiste, please? He has a very interesting question for Fred. Baptiste, are you still with us? Thanks a lot. Um, Go ahead, Baptiste. Can, can you hear me correctly? Yes, loud and clear. Go ahead. Great. Um, sure. So what we see is that, you know, as um, a younger generation in the organization, or as you see more and more like young graduates become and, and, and they propose to use um, uh, programming languages, such as Python, uh, for example, or R, uh, that have not necessarily been used before uh, within the bank, um, or just to use as well more like innovative technologies. When you think about data visualization, you know, you use Tableau um, and uh, or, or, or Click. And you know, my question really is about, you know, how do you, on your side, approach this younger generation, help them navigate within banking, uh, within the bank, to be able to use these technologies or programming languages and you know also certain questions regarding okay if you are you know to someone who would be in, in this generation and and would like to promote these new technologies of programming languages what advice would you give them uh, to be able to to do it you know very and briefly. navigate okay thank you so much thank you uh, thank you Baptiste. very brief uh, answer please fred uh, thank you for the question. First of all, we also use Python, for example. We have a big data department and they use the, the Python language. We do not use R, but uh, we use um, the, the, the Spark uh, framework, etc. So I think banks are adapting this out. It's not the young talent that comes and he has to uh, adopt the bank's rule, but the bank is also learning from the young talents and they will use the tools that the talent brings with and it's familiar with and they will of course build on it so basically it's a it's a give and take of course if you go to the legacy applications that may be a, a different part we have uh, something what we call um a parent i don't know how you call it in english a godfather. A, a godfather a godfather a godmother and when you come this is the person that that will help you go to go all those problems and find out what are your real interests in it and maybe give you if you work on the legacy team to give you one day per week with the data team so that, that they can learn from each other. That's how we approach it. So, Baptiste, you can send your CV directly to Fred. He will take care of you. <laughs> we'll share the, the contact details of Fred afterwards. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody who's listening. I hope it was interesting for you. It was for us, at least. Uh, and I will give just the mic to Anthony to, to wrap up the session. Anthony, the mic is yours.